okay, I'm here. So it's fine. <laughs> so this morning, I'm going to talk to you guys about commitment. But not just commitment as in dedication to something, but I'm talking specifically about de commitment to change, change in the church. Now, ironically, this week, I was so nervous for today. You know, I had the big kidnapping. I mean, I'm coming up here to talk. Um, and I didn't want to say the wrong thing. And I was really scared, and I was really tempted just to say, actually, no, I, I don't want to do it anymore. Um, I, I don't feel like kidnapping. I mean, coming up here, um, I just don't want to do it. And then I was like, well, Hannah, you know, it's kind of Wednesday. It's a little too late for that. You've committed. It's too late. You've just got to do it. Plus, you're a king, so it should, it should come naturally. It's fine. But I wasn't ready for what I was expecting. You folks are the first time I'm teaching to adults. I'm so used to talking to kids and teaching them about God, um, some for the first time, but I also you know, worked at Green Hill. I was um, you know, a youth leader for years. Um, but I was so used to teaching them and how simply I could put it that God loves them and he forgives them every single time. And it kind of just clicked for them. I could just simply say, God loves you, and generally, you they would understand. And the questions that they would ask were amazing. Some of the best questions you will ever get from about faith are from kids, because they will ask you anything. I have gotten some really interesting questions over the years from kids, and they are not scared to ask you. They are fully committed to asking you these questions. They'll ask you anytime, anywhere, it doesn't matter, it will be asked. And it makes you really think, um, because they're just, they're so unique, and I've never thought about it this way. And a kid just opens your eyes to it. And sometimes I think we forget that Jesus told us that kids are the future of heaven. So I have three points for you today. So the first one is committing to the church and the church, big C and little c. The second is committing to God through faith. And the third is sometimes committing means getting uncomfortable. So for scripture today, I have two verses that I'll be mainly focusing on. So we're going to be going to Matthew 4, 19 to 20, and Matthew 28, 19. I don't know if you can read those on the screen there. They're a little small. But I'll read them out to you, so it's okay. So Matthew 4, 19 to 20 says, And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, most people talk about these passages in regards to missions trips or baptizing, and generally, that's what they're typically known for, the going out part. But I want to talk about the commitment that Peter and Andrew have to Jesus. So two summers ago, at Green Hill Lake Camp, what a surprise, um, we were having devotions, and Matthew chapter 4 was the scripture for that day. And again, they were mostly talking about missions trips and everything like that. Even I related it to missions trips because I was talking about how I felt called to go on a missions trip. Um, but one of the questions was, would you go, or could you go? And to be honest, I don't know if I could. These men left everything that they know, their friends, their family, all of their possessions, and they just left. They had Jesus telling them in front of them, I'm gonna make you fishers of men, and they're at, all right, peace out, gotta go. And they just left. They didn't call the bank and say, I, can, I don't know if I can financially afford this. They didn't call their parents and like, hey, I'm going out of town for a couple weeks, uh, make sure you water my plants for me. They just left. They had jobs, they had family, they had connections, and they just left because Jesus called them. He was like, I'm going to make you fishers of men. You're going to build my kingdom with me. And they just went. They didn't think about it. They didn't think twice. They didn't even blink. They just went. Matthew 28, 19 is part of the Great Commission. And again, it's mainly talked about the going out part. But let's talk about the all nations part. So these two passages, we're kind of focusing on two parts. So Matthew 4 is going to be Peter and Andrew and their commitment to Jesus. And then Matthew 28 is going to be the all nations. There are a lot of nations out there. A lot. 
You can think of all the provinces, then think about Africa and all of the countries that are in Africa alone. There's so many out there, and they're not close together. And Jesus told them to go out and tell them about him and do this until the end of the age. Well, the age hasn't ended yet, so that's a really long time. Jesus was roaming the earth a long time ago. I don't know if any of you were around back then, but that, well, that was a long time ago. And they did. They repeat this over and over again throughout the New Testament, like in Luke 24, 47, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Not beginning and ending in Jerusalem, not just in Jerusalem, but beginning from Jerusalem and going out and committing yourself to spreading the word of God and kingdom building, evangelism. And they went out in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit entered them. And at the sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak his own language. God was and still is so determined to build his kingdom with us that he sent us the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, he gave those men the power to be understood in all languages so that everyone around them could be able to, be able to understand what they were saying and hear about God. They heard the good news. These, those men who received the Holy Spirit, they couldn't speak all languages. They were in a town where lots of people would come through, all speaking different languages, because they were all from different nations. And then the Holy Spirit entered, and these people came in the multitude at this loud sound that they heard, and they heard them talking about God in their own language. Dang! There are a lot of languages out there, too. A lot of nations, a lot of languages, and everybody heard, because God was and still is so determined to build his kingdom with us that he gives us the tools to do it with him. In the story of Daniel, he was thrown into a lion's den. A lion's den. Now, that's not very comfortable. A lion's den? Could you imagine? Because he wouldn't stop praying to God. He wouldn't stop worshiping God. He wouldn't stop talking about him. Even though it was made a law that they could only worship King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, that's evangelism. Daniel leads into my second point, committing to God through faith, because Daniel didn't leave God, so he had faith that God wouldn't leave him alone in the den. He risked being eaten by lions to stay committed to God because he had so much faith in him. These people were telling him, you can't worship anybody else except for the king of this land. And Daniel was like, no, I'm going to worship the king of my heart. I'm going to worship the heavenly father, the king of heaven, the king of my heart, not the king of the land, I'll respect him, and I'll still talk to him. And you know what? I'll even talk to him about my God, my amazing God. I'm not going to abandon him. I'm going to commit to God, and I'm going to commit to building his kingdom. And so they threw him in a lion's den. That's not comfortable. It's not. Would you want two lions staring at you when you woke up in the morning? I don't, I don't want that. I have my parents to look at me when I wake up in the morning, and you know what? That's enough. <laughs> God made David king of Israel because he had put all of his trust and commitment in God. Daniel wasn't any older. Oh, one second. There we go. <laughs> Daniel wasn't any older than 15 when he brought three pebbles into battle against a seven to nine foot grown man who was a ruthless warrior. He was mocking Daniel when he walked onto the battlefield. Could you imagine at that age? And Daniel was small for his, or David was small for his age. He was small. And so even at 15, I mean, generally 15-year-old boys, they're kind of big, right? They're taller than me, but I'm short, so it's not that big of a deal. But he went in with three pebbles. Three pebbles. Could you imagine at that age fighting someone like that? It's terrifying. But David wasn't even scared. He was fully prepared for this. He was fully prepared. He had everyone and their mother telling him that this was a stupid idea. You're going to die. And he, was, he basically just told them, don't worry about it. I have God on my side. And they would look at him, and they're like, I really hope you're right, man. Like, good luck. And they just said, all right, I'm going to stand over here, start writing a letter to his family. 
They, were, they didn't believe in him. And then, bam, like that, Goliath was dead from a pebble to the head that had the power of God behind it. Pretty amazing what the commitment to God can do. God just wants us to trust him. He is saying, I have shown you guys my power and love over and over again. When are you guys going to trust me with everything? Every little thing, bring it to me and I will help you. That's all he wants. He wants us to trust in him. That we're not, He's not going to lead us astray. He has a plan for us. We're told this over and over again in the Bible. He has a plan for us to prosper us, not to harm us. Trust him with every little thing. The story of the bleeding woman. We all know it, right? Yes? Nods, heads? Yes? Great. Um, I think she might be one of the most important examples of commitment and trust in God in the Bible, and she doesn't even have a name. She's one of the most talked about women in the Bible, and we don't even know her name. But she fully had faith in God because she was bleeding for years, and she tried to heal herself. She w spent all of her money on doctors and medicine and everything that she could think of. She tried it, and it didn't work. But then one day she heard about this guy who was coming to town who was the son of God and could perform miracles. And she said, I really need to meet this guy. He could be my saving grace. So she went to um, a crowd that was swarming Jesus, and she reached out and she touched the fringe of his garment. Now, when you're definitely talking about fringe, you're talking about the end of the garment. So I think it's safe to say she got on her hands and knees to touch Jesus. And she was instantly healed. And Jesus felt it. And he said, who was that who touched me? Now the disciples were like, dude, we're in a swarm of people here. Are you serious right now? Who touched you? There are hundreds and thousands of people touching you right now. How can you narrow it down? Like, that guy touched you over there, but that guy did too. Like, who are you talking about? But Jesus knew. And when the woman came forward and trembling at his feet, he told her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. That's not what she was expecting. She was expecting to be in trouble. She talked to, touched the Son of God. She was, she was a servant. She wasn't supposed to touch the Son of God. He was an important guy. She was expecting to be in trouble. She was expecting to do, be harmed in some way. But he was like, your faith in me has made you well. Go and live your life. Be happy. You've trusted me, and I am happy for you. And the disciples saw this, and they were amazed. Yet another miracle from our guy, Jesus. He just cannot be stopped. Miracle after miracle. But this woman was uncomfortable and got even more uncomfortable, and it paid off. And you know what? Sometimes commitment means getting uncomfortable, which just so happens to be our third point. Wow, see what I did there? It's great. <laughs> So one example of this that I don't think is ever really talked about is the king of Nineveh, or just the people in Nineveh in general. Now, if you somehow forget who the people in Nineveh are, they're the people that God told Jonah to go talk to. But they scared him so much, because, you know, they were murderers, thieves, rapists, not really great people to hang around. You wouldn't invite them to coffee. Um, so, you know, Jonah did the only logical thing and went in the opposite direction. He was like, all right, God, no, I hear you. I got, I got this. Now, I'm actually going to, you know, take a detour, go this way, even though Nineveh is that way, hop on a boat, and I'll see you later. And, you know, God wasn't too happy about that. He was like, no, I, I need you to go deliver a message for me. So um, he sent a storm, then a fish, because, you know, storm, fish, yes, logical, right? Um, and that fish you know, brought Jonah over to the beach of Nineveh, spat him out, and Jonah sat there, and he was like, fine, I'll go, I suppose. And he begrudgingly went to the town square of Nineveh and told them that God wasn't happy with them, and he was going to destroy their city. Now, Nineveh, huge, takes three days to see. How many Fredericton's do you think that is? Fredericton isn't very big. How many do you think that is? I don't know. Five, maybe? More? Probably. It's a big city. It has over 10,000 residents. Lots. 
And he went and he said, God isn't happy with you. And you're gonna, he's going to destroy your city. And they're like, ooh, we need to, we need to change some things. We're not, we're not acting right here. We need to fix things up. But I want to focus on what the king did when he heard Jonah's message because he even took it a step further because the people, they were fasting, you know, they dressed themselves in sackcloth, they were great, they repented of their sin. Awesome, love it, love to see it. But the king, and I quote, arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Now, let's picture your typical throne, right, your royalty throne, Generally, they're really shiny, covered in gold, jewels, beautiful, great cushion to sit on so your butt doesn't get sore. It's great, right? Fit for a king. Well, this king was like, God's not happy with me. So he left his comfortable throne and he dressed himself in itchy and uncomfortable burlap. Now, my dad likes to joke with me that he would like to get me a burlap sack because, you know, I'm his youngest daughter and his last kid, and he would have much rather seen me wear a burlap sack to prom than a very pretty prom dress, because heaven forbid I look pretty in it. Heaven forbid. Anytime I get dressed up nicely, he instantly says, all right, we need a burlap sack over here, or we need a burqa, or something like that, right? Burlap sacks, they're not comfortable. They're itchy. They're used to beg potatoes. They're used to cover trees. Not something a king would wear. It's uncomfortable. And God, uh, the, this king heard this warning that God wasn't happy with him or his people, and it was like he woke up from a bad dream. He woke up and he was like, all right, I need to fix myself, I need to fix my behavior, and it paid off yet again. Getting uncomfortable paid off. Because God looked at this huge, massive city that takes three days to see that was full of sinners who all repented for him by fasting and giving up their possessions, and he forgave every single one of them because they got uncomfortable to show their commitment to the change they wanted to see and to God because they knew that they were in the wrong. They didn't say, oh, you know what? God is just playing with us. Like, it's fine. It's not that big deal. It's all good. No big deal. He'll just change his mind. He'll forgive us anyway. He loves us. It's fine. But they were like, no, we need to change our behavior, our attitude, what we're doing with our life. And we're going to change it for the better. Sometimes you have to get a little outside your comfort zone to see the change you want to see in the church or in your life. But you've got to get outside your bubbles. I really like my bubble. It's my personal space bubble. I love it. It's great. I tell my campers, don't burst my bubble. I tell campers, don't burst other people's bubbles. But sometimes we have to expand our bubbles or move with our bubbles. Yes, keep your bubbles. Don't pop other people's bubbles. You know, personal space is great. But get uncomfortable. Push yourself to for God's message. If you want to see the congregation grow, invite more people to come with you. Or... Technology is pretty great now because you can just give them the link because, you know, baby steps is maybe is what they need. Maybe they're not ready to come into church yet because they're not, you know, fully committed and they just want to test the waters. And you're like, okay, I have something for you. I can give you this link. Watch it. We have this really great summer student, Hannah. She's full of energy. She's great. You'll love her. But there's baby steps that they can take. If you want to see the church with a capital C, the church is the people not the building. The people get the capital letter, the building gets the lowercase letter. Because why have a big building without people to fill it with? You have to see the congregation grow both in their faith and in numbers. Work with the people first, then focus on the possessions that you have, like your church building. Right? Show God's love through kindness or patience or any of the fruits of the Spirit. You know? Um, sometimes my friends make fun of me because I always say thank you to anyone, and I mean anyone who serves me at a restaurant or a store or even holds the door open for me because I think that's just basic politeness. You know, I'm Canadian. I say thank you for everything. Um, or sorry. You know, that's also, you know, what we do. But that just shows God's love through my actions just for being kind. 
1 Corinthians, love is patient and kind. It does not boast, it does not envy. You know that passage? Very infamous, read at weddings, Valentine's Day. It's a great love passage. But love is patient, love is kind. 1 John 4.16 says, God is love. Whoa. God is love. All right, so God is patient, God is kind. If I show God's love, then I can be patient and kind. And you know what? It brightens people's days, and they're like, wow, that person was really nice. I wonder why they were so nice. Hey, random stranger, why were you so nice? And you could be like, hey, I have God's love in me. I love you. He loves you. You should come to church sometime. Whoa. I mean, I don't think it would happen like that, but it could, <laughs> right? It could. It could happen like that. You've got to get uncomfortable outside of your comfort zone. It's great. Trust in him and have faith that he's not going to lead you astray. Abraham was told by God, sacrifice your son Isaac. And Abraham was like, okay. God, you're not going to tell me to do something without a purpose. And God was like, ding, 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 Abraham, you won. Now you're blessed and you're going to father all nations. Whoa. We trusted in God and now Abraham is the father of all nations. That's a pretty big blessing. Just by trusting God is not going to lead you astray. He doesn't give you something that doesn't have a purpose behind it. Right? But commit yourself in some way to God, because if you do, I can guarantee you two things. Maybe. If my pointer... Ugh, it doesn't work. Anyway. Um, if you do, I can guarantee you two things. One, you won't regret it. You won't. I can guarantee you that. And two... You will see amazing things happen in your life and everything else around you. Because you're not going to regret it if you commit yourself to God in some way. doesn't matter what way, but in some way, if you commit your life to God, you are not going to regret it. And you're going to see amazing things happen all around you. Maybe in your life or someone that you care about. It's going to be great. It's going to be amazing. I can promise you that. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you so much for loving us and always forgiving us and putting your trust and faith in us to spread your message. God, I pray that the words that you have given me today have touched someone in here. God, I pray that we commit to you in any way that you call us to. God, I pray that we know where you're leading us and that you don't lead us astray, and we trust that you're not going to lead us astray. I want to thank you so much for everything that you've given us, all of the wonderful examples that you've given us and let out for us. And I just want to thank you so much, Lord. You're so good. In your name I pray. Amen. All right. <laughs>